In tough times, folks are concerned that if they keep cash in the bank, the bank itself may fail. And so in this video, I'm going to walk you through a simple step to avoid bank failures and keep your cash intact. Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson. If you'd like to learn how Nomad Capitalist helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally protect their money, diversify internationally, reduce their taxes, and go where they're treated best, go to nomadcapitalist.com and learn more. So bank failures. Bank failures are something that we don't really think about too much when times are good. But when times turn bad, we wonder, is my money in the bank safe? I lived in the United States. I lived in the Western United States where markets dropped by as much as 50% during the last recession. And it was a thing. You would turn on the news and, and almost every day there was some bank that was failing. I think in, in the biggest year you saw hundreds of bank failures. And uh, I'm a, an advocate of keeping some cash. I'm also an advocate of having property, having precious metals. Perhaps you want cryptocurrency if that's your thing. I like to be totally diversified, but I do like to have some cash. And so how do you make sure that it's safe? Well, if you look at the statistics, the number one thing you can do to avoid a bank failure is not bank in the United States. Because if you look at banks in the United States, they had a couple good years, you know, 2018, I think there were zero bank failures. 2017, you had a couple, 2019, you had a couple. Um, but you know, over you know, the last decade, there have been a lot of bank failures. Uh, now, you look at Europe, for example, they've taken a different kind of action as you saw in some of the southern European countries, they've restricted people's access to money or even done bail-ins. And now you've seen other countries like in Australia, other developed countries put in bail-in rules where uh, you can be on the hook if your money's deposited in the bank. And so while some of those banks not be, may not be as likely to fail, just because sometimes there aren't as many banks in those countries, uh, you may actually take some kind of haircut in tough times. And so you know, really what I see is when I go out and look at the emerging world banks, the banks that some folks are concerned about, the, 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 the banks that the average person you would talk to at a cocktail party would freak out. You know, if you said, hey, I just opened a, a bank account in Armenia, you know, they would be like, what? What are you talking about? We go through and we'll look at reports for a lot of countries where we uh, help folks do banking. We have clients and we will help them open bank accounts. We'll go through reports that are often put together by um, you know, big analytical companies or, or big four firms. And when you compare, you know, some of the ratios, some of the liquidity numbers in these banks and emerging world currency uh, companies, uh, countries rather, to developed world countries, the numbers are much higher in emerging world countries. In fact, there are a few offshore banks that simply don't make any loans at all. They're just <laughs> holding on to your money and, and giving you a place to, to store it and do transactions. They don't even make loans. What I think is that while uh, there are some developed countries that are relatively safe, certainly there are good banks in the United States. I still do keep money in the United States. Countries like Singapore uh, are good and other developed countries, you know, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, if you can get in there, others. Uh, those are good places to park some money. I also think if you want to get some yield and if you want to give yourself some diversification, going to these safe emerging market banks is a good idea because they're a lot easier to deal with. You can commit less capital. So if you, if you find yourself doing it, you know, needing money for a transaction at some point, they, they're not going to require you to keep a million dollars in there. You can move money in and out. Uh, but while, again, it's not true about every place, uh, I quite frankly think that if you look at the banks in many emerging countries, in Eastern Europe, in Central Asia, in Southeast Asia really in particular, uh, even some in South America, the numbers are often better. When I look at all the bank crises, that make the big news, okay? You're seeing them in the United States. And we saw during the last recession, even Washington Mutual, one of the largest banks in the country, was not immune. You see in the United States, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures your deposits. Now, when a bank fails, sometimes they don't have to step in. Sometimes another bank just comes and they take everyone's deposits, even those above the insured limit. That's all good. But if, if a big bank in the United States were to fail, they have like less than a penny for every dollar of deposits. Uh, and so, you know, one big bank or a couple decent sized banks could, could, you know, 
crash the whole system. Am I saying that's going to happen? No, but I'm saying these alleged safeguards are there because the country is a brand name. This is the big thing I'm talking about this year is the brand name country. Okay? People go to the United States and they tolerate low yields and they tolerate high taxes and they tolerate all kinds of things. And the same in Europe because they are brand name countries. Okay? Now, Singapore is a brand name country that I think deserves a bit more of a reputation uh, because they've done a pretty good job managing things. Even Hong Kong, despite some of the chaos there, those banks have always been super conservative. But the developed uh, countries, especially the English-speaking countries, have always been, you know, throwing out loans to anyone. I mean, now you see a lot of the subprime loans in the United States that were a problem uh, back in the, in the last recession. They're back to doing that. Banks are doing subprime car loans again. You know, Wall Street's gotten into buy here, pay here car lots. I mean, people don't learn their lesson in the West. And what I think is very interesting is in the safe havens outside of the Western world, the Singapore's, for example, uh, or other, you know, developed Asian countries. Uh, those folks have already, always been more conservative, in my opinion. Those numbers have always looked better. If you go to some of the emerging market countries, sometimes those are countries where 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, the place was a disaster. And perhaps folks learned their lesson. Okay, um, so if you want to keep your money safe, I've always said diversifying it uh, is a good idea. Uh, you, know, you saw, you could have had three bank accounts in Cyprus or in Greece <laughs> or in some of these other countries where they just got shut down and raided. That wouldn't have helped, right? If you put your money in a bunch of Australian banks and Australia has a problem um, and they've got to do bail-ins, I don't know that you're going to be immune because you're in a couple of different banks. International diversification is the goal. Now, I don't tell people uh, how much risk or lack of risk or perceived risk they should take. Uh, if you want to move all your money and put it in countries like Singapore, that's cool. I like having a nice blend so I can get some return. Um, I can get some all different kinds of benefits. Uh, but really, the developed countries... Uh, bank ratios at many of them are not that good, especially right now in Europe. Uh, and so diversifying into countries that most people wouldn't consider, in my mind, is one of the best ways to avoid suffering a bank failure or a bail-in. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your Nomad Capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.